did a documentary for the National Film Board called Me and the Moth. And I had traveled across the country talking to men and women about the structure of moths. We had a moth in Regina. And I was going to make sure. Is that better? Is that not popping as much? Okay, that's better. I, we had a moth in Regina where suddenly um, a curtain came between the men and women. And the women were told to pray behind it. And, and this created a lot of anxiety in the moth about what is the role of women in a moth and where do they pray. And I ended up researching the whole issue. And during the time the prophet peace be upon him, men and women prayed in the same hall, and there had been no curtain or glass between men and women. And, and women would stand and, and be heard, and, and you know, they had things to complain about. They could be, they could voice their complaints if they heard something this morning that violated their rights. And but now there had this tradition had grown up where they were hidden behind glass walls and curtains and in balconies. And it wasn't really part of our faith, but people were starting to mix up theology um, and tradition. And so I made a documentary called Me and the Moss, and I had asked some of the scholars from all over the world about where this come from, and they said, no, it shouldn't exist. It's come from ideas that people really should be seen or heard in the Moss, and it is not women's opinion and their presence is very important. And I knew that it was, you know, I was battling patriarchy and misogyny and, I, and not faith, but because people thought I was Faith. I had to move to the, the roots were in Islam. So I went across the country and I was interviewing Islamic scholars from all over North America, very senior, high level male scholars, right, to say what I needed them to say. And they said it, and I made a documentary called Me in the Mosque, and I thought to myself, what would it be like if my mom was born and raised in Canada and also felt the same that I did and became an imam in the mosque in Canada? How would that change the dynamic in the community? And I pitched that idea to see. And you know, to be honest with you, I didn't take my pitch very seriously because it was 2005, 2006. And at that time period, there were no Canadian sitcoms. The last sitcom we had, I think, was King of Kensington. <laughs> the, the Beachcombers? And there was a sense in Canada that we couldn't make sitcoms. It just wasn't a, a thing Canadians could do. And so when the idea came, the comedy people at CBC said, you know, we've been Islam and Muslim centered in the zeitgeist. And we had, you know, this was after the cartoon controversy in Europe and all this violence. And they were like, you've managed to capture this community at a time when people are talking about this community. So this would be the perfect time to make a show about this. And I mean, there's an episode, too, that's about women and men playing in different areas, too. Um, so when you pitched the show, was it something that people like, took on right away, or there are lots of questions like, how are you going to do this? You know, because I feel like it's the kind of thing that people would fight about. It wouldn't be something that everybody would just, yeah, let's do it. I think that it was so new, the idea was so new, and nobody really knew what was going to happen. And nobody understood, like, the ramifications of making the show, including myself. I look back, thank God I didn't know what, what would happen. And the, the nuttiness that would ensue. We were all so innocent. We just thought this would be so nice. It'll just probably be a minor limp in the CBC history. It'll probably disappear after an episode or two. Nothing's going to come out of it. No one, nobody, including the CBC, had any idea that it would explode and become this phenomenal success. We started to get an inkling that things were bigger than they were going to be when the American media got told of these rumors that Canada was doing a show about Islam and Muslims, and it was a comedy about, and it was in the mosque, and they, and, then they started coming up to Canada and started interviewing us. Mixed with the New York Times and CNN and you know, Al Jazeera. And we were like, why Why are people paying attention to us? And, and I think we didn't realize that people assumed that doing a, t a comedy about Islam was going to result in violence and you know, Muslims are going to burn the cars and you know, blow up the CBC building. They were literally expecting the country to walk in flames. And so they were trying to document our country's pre <laughs> And so suddenly the, the Canadian media was like, what is happening? Like, what is the CBC doing? And then they started writing all these articles about us and all this media about us. And so what was happening was we started getting all this attention that normally television shows in Canada do not get because we don't have the millions and millions of ad dollars that American shows have. And that was why Canadian television shows had failed up at that point. Because no one knew they existed. They, you know, no, they would be, we couldn't compete with the American television that existed down there. They would just inundate whatever were, you know, airways with the commercials. But for the first time, a television show in Canada was getting so much press. And ironically, because they thought that the, the CBC had made some horrible error of judgment 
and it was just being burned to the ground when it came out. So by the time we aired, we aired like to record ratings. Like CBC hasn't had ratings like that till Anne of Avenue 20 years prior. And so we were overnight, we were like this massive hit that no one expected could be a hit. Because let's face it, right, this was before all the buzzwords of diversity and representation, as you were saying, before Blackish, I mean, before any of that stuff. Like this was the first show that had the lead characters who were non-white. So they literally did not expect white people would want to watch it. So they thought it would just be nice, you know, we would tick off all the demo, all the boxes, and, and it, we, you know, we would satisfy the CRTC regulations for having, you know, regional and Saskatchewan and brown people and so on. And then it becomes this monster head that no one saw coming. And then they decided, hey, you know, why are we shooting it in Saskatchewan? Like only she lives there. And then they decided to move into Toronto, you know, a big political decision. And so then, you know, me with my four little kids and, and my husband's like, listen, there's no way like seven white guys in the room are going to be able to write a comedy about Muslims. You know, in a room, you're going to have to go and teach them what Islam is and what, what, what it's like living in this community. Because up to that point, Muslims went into science, they went into engineering, they went into these very technical fields. There were no Muslim stand-ups, there were no Muslim writers, there were, you know, it was the, we hadn't gone into that area. So I was one, I was the first one. So we had to be part of this writing team to make sure that it was authentic and, you know, to, to and spoke truth to what my experiences were. When we watched that episode, what were some particular dramas that happened in the making of that episode because of the statue and the, the like you called in consultants to, to do that episode, right? I was scared to do this episode because, you, I mean, it's one thing when you make fun of your own religion, you know, I feel it's fair game, but now I was going and, you know, potentially making fun of Christians. And I didn't know what the sensitivity was, and it was, you know, I had a Catholic writer who's a little bit like, well, should we be doing this? And I'm like breaking, I know, breaking, this was like out of my comfort zone, breaking a statue, because how do white people feel, how do Christians feel? So we brought in a consultant. I did not know that statues were a big thing in, in the Anglican church, right? I didn't know that that, that would be uh, offensive. And then we brought in a, a consultant. I think she, I forget which denomination she was from, but she was very anti-statue, and she accused me of um, wanting to bring idolatry back into Christianity. I mean, to tell a Muslim that you're trying to bring idolatry back into their religion is like crazy, right? Like that's like saying, oh, I want all, you know, I want to bring alcohol back. I'm like, no, like that, we're like, we're crazy when it comes to, you know, to idol worship, like we're like, you know, psychotic when it comes to those things. And so I remember feeling very uneasy and unsure and, and having to lean on, you know, on the non-Muslim writers going, but you have to let me know if I'm stepping on toes or your sensitivities. I don't like this is out of my comfort zone. I don't know how it would be. But then, it, but after it aired, everyone you know seemed quite happy with it and, and was were, were, were at ease with it. But that just tells you like when you step, when you go outside of your own realm, you you depend on other people to let you know whether or not it's if you're going too far. <laughs> well, I, I mean, as a black Christian, like it's hilarious to me. I laugh through the whole thing because and, and I think it has to do with something about when we take ourselves too seriously and when things become too sort of strict and rigid, it actually removes, I don't know, it takes something away. And I remember there was a study that's been done about the impact of Little Box and the Prairie on Islamophobia. And can you talk about that study? Because I remember it was really yeah. work. Uh, I reported the CNN phone me, and they said, you know, there's, there's finally been a study that measures people's um, prejudices. And they hadn't done this before, and I didn't realize that. What they did was they got a random sample of people and had them watch. They they measured their attitude towards Muslims and Islam, and then they had them watch six episodes of Friends, which is a show about white people. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of diversity in that show, right? Now. And then they had them watch six episodes of The Lost the Prairie, and then they measured their um, the levels of prejudice against Islam and Muslims, and. The people who watched the six episodes of Friends had stayed exactly the same, but the people who watched the Lost in Prairie, it, it became lower. And so that was interesting, because what it meant was that when we see people as fully formed human beings in television, it has a big impact on how we think about that community and what stereotypes we believe or discuss. I, I, I think, and one of the quotes I found was about the Crosby Show, and I remember feeling that growing up about the Crosby Show. Like it was the one place that you could see yourself, or I felt, there was another option. We weren't just going to be gang bangers or criminals or in these negative lights. We were this funny, rich family, right? And so, like, I, I really, I thought they're so fascinating, and the way that, like, the way comedy in particular plays a different role even than drama, right? 
I think it lowers your guard, so you're yeah. willing to see people as real people, and then you laugh. You can talk about very serious, difficult issues, and be able to connect with people, there's sort of a, a connection that people make with other people. Do you think the show would be different if it came out today? Like, would there be different things that you would do? Would it have a different kind of impact? It's so interesting. I think back in 2007, and I thought that was a tough time for Muslims. But now I look back, and, and you can tell it was a very innocent time, and it reflects that innocence innocence and his attitude and the sweetness of the relationships with the new people, even Reverend Thorne and Barbara and Amar. But if I was to make it today, I think it would have to have a very different tone and be much edgier and you know tackle subjects in a different way because I feel like you know the world has become a much more divided and more difficult place to live. It must be interesting to see it come back in a different form. I would like to make another television show to deal with the issue that we're dealing with today, but in a very different form, because I think we can talk about those things. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a, the, the world is ready for a very different type of show now. Well, one of the things that was really exciting for me to find out when you came here to the, the first time we met was that you had grown up in Brampton, and that coming back for the festival was the first time you had been here in a really long time. And so I'm curious about what growing up in Brampton was like for you. So this is a difficult question because you know, I'm getting the award from the city of Brampton. But Brampton itself was a very different place 25 years ago. And there weren't a lot of minorities. It was very white, which is fine. But it was also very difficult um, in many ways because at that point, you know, I came to Canada in 1972, and that was when Canada had uh, gotten rid of the last restrictions, the ethnic restrictions, because it used to be ethnic restrictions of what ethnicities were allowed in Canada. And so South Asians were banned, and then they had gotten rid of those. And so there was a huge wave of people from Pakistan had come, and my family was part of that wave. And whenever there was a big wave of one particular ethnic group, there was always a backlash against that community. And so we came just as the backlash was happening, and and people were very upset that you know people from Pakistan were here. And I remember being a young child and going to school, and there would be like these kind of groups of bullies that would catch us, you know, in every corner. And then we would have, you know, we would be essentially today would be called assault, but we'd get kind of beaten up on the way to school, and it and it became a, a huge problem, just kind of where to hide, where to go, where to, where to how we would to make it. We, my brother and I, my brother was like a, like a year younger than me, we would have secret codes. If we saw a certain bully coming, we would tell each other we'd run the other way. And it was just kind of this obstacle course, trying to get to school safe. And the teachers at that time, like, there was no anti-bullying thing at school, right? They knew we were getting beaten up, and they, it was just like, it was just like a, you know, a normal thing for them. And my brother, um, like my father didn't know what to do, so he put us in karate classes, and so we could learn self-defense. And so we went to karate classes so that we could defend ourselves. And my brother ended up taking those classes so seriously, he became a black belt, and now he owns his own um, mixed martial arts gym in Burlington. <laughs> he ended up giving up his entire career. We were all supposed to be doctors. I ended up becoming this. And <laughs> he, he ended up owning his own gym and becoming a mixed martial arts you know, instructor. To this day, that's his life. And But it really affected him psychologically. Like, even when I told him I was coming to Brampton, I just I was like, my mom, don't. But, those were tough years. Those were really tough, difficult years. And I just want, you know, instead of having him come to Brandon, just come to our house, go where we live now, just say hi, but don't bring him here because it affected him more than it affected me. But you grow up with resilience, right? You grow up tougher and stronger, and you, you know what's out there with the world, and you experience that hate. And, you, and so, I mean, I, I would say to you that it, it made me more appreciative, you know, of what life is like. And what and the obstacles. And I think kids who grow up in a, in a tough neighborhood situation, you know, they grow up with sort of more grit and, and, and knowing that it's tough out there and you have to be tougher if you're going to make it with a thicker skin. Did you find yourself out in Regina, Saskatchewan, by some means? And so I'm curious about that, what it was like growing up in the prairies in contrast, and also especially as a mom who's been through that as a kid, and now has brown kids growing up in a predominantly white community again, how that may be affected or helped in parenting your kids? Well, my husband, he grew up in Saskatchewan, and since he's been there since he was two, and when he heard my stories, he was just like appalled because 
he's from Bengali ancestry, and nothing happened to him. <laughs> it was perfectly safe and fine. But what happened was that there hadn't been Saskatchewan, there hadn't been this wave of immigration. That only happened in the last, between 2007 and two, you know, 2017, that 10-year period, we had a huge influx of immigration. So for him growing up, he was one of the very few brown, brown faces in his in his neighborhoods, so people were threatened. They didn't feel threatened. The people who did feel threatened, though, were the First Nations community. And this is something that I didn't even know. Like, First Nations community, we didn't grow up at school, we didn't learn about them, we knew nothing about them and their history. And then I moved to Saskatchewan, where the largest reserves in Canada are. And that, that's when the, you know, my eyes opened up to this incredible racism that existed for the First Nations community. And how we were treated growing up in Brampton was how they were had been treated for, for centuries, right, since the beginning. And so that was that was huge for me to understand and, and to become empathetic to that you know to that type of treatment. It's only and my kids didn't grow up with any overt racism. It's only now that they're starting to see it because of the huge waves of immigration. Our, our population in Saskatchewan started to decline in 2006, and that's because typically people in Saskatchewan go to Calgary or bigger centers for jobs and economic opportunity. So the the government said, you know, if we don't do something very quickly, if the tax base keeps falling, we're going to be and so they did what a lot of provinces did. They said, we've got to suck them out of Toronto and Vancouver. We've got to give them incentives to come to Saskatchewan. So they said that if you pick Saskatchewan as your port of entry, instead of these other cities, will fast track family reunification and citizenship and give you all these perks. And literally overnight, like entire villages must have just discovered us. And our population grew like, by like 165,000 people in like a, a 10 year period. It was huge. And so, the whole province of like a million people yeah. in total. Yeah. So, that, that, just, so the entire demographic of Saskatchewan changed. It started, it started to remind me of what Toronto was like in the 70s growing up. It, that's, and so that, you started to you know, hear more stories and more issues. Well, one of the things that the book tackles um, is your relationship with your mom and also your decision to wear a job. And you know, I wanted to have this conversation because I know a big topic in Canada right now. There's controversy in Quebec where they're trying to ban it, and it seems, I don't think it seems, I think it is a significant choice for a woman today, and it was a significant choice for you then, and I just, I, tell us a little bit about that. So it was the 1980s when I started to wear it, and it was grade nine, high school, and back then nobody wore it, right? So I was part of the first wave of young women who decided to wear it, and I think, you know, it was part of trying to find your community, trying to fit in, trying to, you know, you're already kind of growing up in a very hostile and difficult environment, but people just clearly didn't want you there. And, and my parents would take us to the mosque every week. And you, know, you could sense, you could sense you know, feeling of community and belonging. And so it was part of belonging to this group and identifying as, as, as you know, being a practicing Muslim. And it was, but it was hard because no one knew what we were doing and we looked very strange and we looked alien. Not like today where it's just normal and you know, go to Walmart as a cashier or whatever. And I was really lucky because the teachers were like, that's weird, but whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, what you want to do. Because we had a, a multicultural policy of religious accommodation and not that, not that it was ever articulated in that fashion, but no one said anything to it. So, the, which was a really great thing because I think I wouldn't have known what to do if someone says you can that because in Europe, Muslim girls can't wear the hijab if they go to high school if they are actually removed from school. And that's caused a big division in the Muslim community in terms of feeling like they're welcome or they're, they can't sort of feel assimilated as part of the society. And the fact that I wore it and, and I was allowed to wear it and nobody really said anything made a huge difference with me being able to continue to be Muslim and to practice my faith and to assimilate and then to feel comfortable being Canadian of Muslim faith, that I can now go back and say make a documentary about the Muslim community criticizing, you know, patriarchal structures. So I didn't feel like I was being attacked. I felt like this, you know, this is part of my identity and it was accepted. And I mean it's you know, when I talk about France and European countries, to take a girl out of school and to deny her, her education is a horrible thing. And when you think of the other country that would do that would say the Taliban, right? And you're like, well, this is kind of a secularized version of the same thing because some of these girls wouldn't go back to school because that, it meant that much to them. Does it ever feel, do you still feel, I guess the question is, a lot of people come to you when there's a crisis, especially around um, Muslim faith, 
And is that something you enjoy doing, talking about it, defending your faith, speaking about it? Or is it something that you're just sort of, like, I wish they'd asked me about something else? <laughs> in, my, in my opinion, but Brianna, I don't have any Yeah, no, it's true. You do get a little tired. I, I Like, after New Zealand, I was like, oh my god, no. And then my... Did you get called that? Yeah, I, the CBC asked me to write a piece. It took a long time, a week, right? You don't write a piece a week after it happens, right? So I, it just got published today. If you Google New Zealand's Dark, it comes up. And it took a long time to write because it was it was hard. Like how do you how do you articulate that down to like you know 500 words? But I, what I'm really glad to see now is that you know, in my day, medicine was pretty much the only career we ever chose, but I'm seeing a larger and larger group of Muslims going into the arts, going into journalism and filmmaking and writing and, and, and writing opinion pieces. And you're finally seeing that happening. And I've actually met Muslim parents who now come up to me I'm disappointed that my child wants to go into medicine. I'd rather they become a journalist because they can see the danger of what happens if we aren't representing our own community in the media. Because if you let someone else do it, they'll do it this other way that can become well, I always love to poke into what's next with people and to find out not only, you know, looking back at some of the projects you've done, but what's what's next? What are you working on these days? So about five years ago, as you probably realize, most of my inspiration comes from the media and politics and world events. So in 2014, ISIS came of age, and I just couldn't process what was happening in the Middle East. So I started writing a novel. Because sort of like my, my therapy to survive this whole process. So I, wrote, I started writing a novel about a Muslim woman similar to myself who is trying to sort this whole issue out in her mind, like what is happening. And she's gone, going through her own personal trauma and you know, personal pain. And she accidentally joins them and winds up in the Middle East and she brings them down through sheer incompetence. She becomes like the first Western just trying to get rid of them. Like, what? <laughs> and so I, I thought, oh, I can't, you know, at that time, ISIS was very scary, and I thought, I can't call them ISIS. So I called the book The Dominion of the Islamic Caliphate in Kingdoms. So the book was called The Rise and Fall of Dick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so understandably, the publishers are a little bit like confused. <laughs> and I admit it was maybe a bit too soon to do the comedy about ISIS. <laughs> so I had to wait a little bit because the publishers were like, no way. <laughs> And so I was kind of looking at my moves, going, oh, but I spent four years on this. And, and then suddenly CBC called and said, would you like to work with us for us again? Because we haven't, you know, you're sort of kicking around, and there was this opportunity to be a radio host. So I took an eight-month stint being the host of the morning show, uh, similar to Metro Morning. So it was really amazing like to go, kind of take, take a step away from my storytelling world and, and go back to my journalism world. And so I did this thing for eight months where I was the host the radio show, got to connect with people in the province. And then once that ended, the opportunity to become the host of the 6 o'clock news happened. And I thought, well, this is different, like to, do, to actually be an anchor of the Saskatchewan 6 o'clock news. And so I did it. And they gave me like a $4,000 budget, which I know is not a lot, but still for, you know, as for like a makeup and clothes. And so, <laughs> but get this, you guys, you have to return the clothes because they paid for them. But you don't have to return the makeup because obviously it's, you know. So of course, I didn't buy the clothes. I had enough because I'm so greedy. And so I you know, I went to Sephora and I, I'll take one of everything. <laughs> makeup is really, really expensive. My budget, two months, gone. Then I resigned. <laughs> I couldn't do it. No, he didn't, I didn't resign because of the makeup budget. I resigned. <laughs> because what I was doing was there's like a little foot pedal and you press it in the little teleprompter and you read the news. And I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Like I would sit there and I'd have to read the teleprompter and, and say the news and you couldn't deviate, like not one sentence beyond what was the news. And there was like, you know, other than standing beside the, the climatologist and saying, it's a great day. And how, how often, like, oh, it was horrible. Every day I had to make up something about, it's cold again. It is, it's cold again. Yes, it's cold again. It's cold again. It's cold. You know, we gotta make, we plug in our cars because it got like minus 30 for like four weeks in Saskatchewan. And so we have, I don't think they do that in Canada. I don't think they do that in Ontario. We have block heaters and you have to plug your car in. <clears throat> Otherwise, it won't start in the morning so that it can keep heating all night. Otherwise, there's your. <laughs> so, 
So, so you know, I'm going to make sure you plug in your car tonight. You know, and I was so excited. I was like, I can't do this after. Like, two and a half months, I'm like, I'm out. And I realized the reason I was out was because the feelings that I had like 25 years earlier were gone. And the journals were coming back was that I was this creative person and I couldn't, I couldn't do those creative things anymore, like tell my kooky, crazy stories and process the world through comedy and story. And, I, and, and journalism just was too limiting, especially television. When you go to television, it's like the, what they call the military, very strict rule. And so then I resigned after two and a half months and um, February 28th was my last day. And so I decided to go back to my world. So I rewrote my, I had to write my book um, with a bit more, as my editor put it, Heart? yes, they felt that I had made it too wacky, and that I was. And, and the trouble with my comedy is that I get too superficial and too kooky with the comedy, and that I have to grind, ground it in more human relationships and experience. And so I rewrote the book. It took another year to rewrite it, and I'm hoping that this time, to, you know, Trump is, has been elected since I started writing the book, and you know, ISIS has come, you know, down from the media thanks to Trump. So. I'm hoping enough time has passed and that the publisher will, will be less squeamish about the comedy. Is it still called the same Well, they tell me not to <laughs> marry to the title. <laughs> It'll probably change. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. Yeah. So um, it's going to be nice because after some of the media stuff, you actually probably get a chance to talk to Larga one on one. Um, so if you have questions that you want to ask her, I know she's really hilarious with like everything, so you can ask her directly. Um, at this time, um, we can step down and we're going to invite uh, Mayor Brown to the microphone uh, for the formal part of the Art Talk Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you and uh, good evening everyone. It's an honor to be here tonight to welcome Zarfa Nawaz back to Brampton for her induction into Brampton's Arts Walk of Fame. Um, we are so excited to be here and to celebrate this very special occasion with you in your hometown. Like many other Bramptonians, Zarka immigrated to Brampton with her family at a young age, and as she mentions in her best-selling memoir, laughing all the way to the mosque, she attended Hollandale Elementary School and Shifuzi Secondary School before going on to the University of Toronto. Ryerson University, and ultimately an incredible career in comedy. Her groundbreaking hit TV show, Little Mosque on the Prairie, was the world's first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West, running for six seasons on CBC, broadcasting in over 60 countries, which is absolutely amazing. Post 9-11, Muslims went through a time of increasing hate crimes because of a lack of understanding of Muslims and Islam. Zarka tackled address, addressing demystifying Islam head on through humor with her show Little Moss on the Prairie. Zarka has brought great pride to Brampton through her incredible artistic achievements in filmmaking, journalism, and broadcasting. She is also highly sought after a public speaker on Islam and comedy, gender and faith, multiculturalism, and plurality. Zarka, you have made the city so proud with your accomplishments and have inspired the next generation of artists and creators to follow in your footsteps. And before I have the official honor to present the Brampton Arts Walk of uh, Fame, when you have role models like this, it's easy to create an environment uh, in, in our community where we uh, celebrate uh, different faiths. And we saw a fair bit of that this week. Uh, last night we had a vigil um, for the uh, 50 individuals, men, women, and children who were murdered in Christchurch, and we had faith leaders from all different uh, communities in Brampton pray for the Muslim community, um, to say when one community is attacked, we're all attacked. And then today, there was a group of rabbis who in 18 different mosques and synagogues had a, uh, a circle of prayer uh, to show uh, the support for the Muslim community. And we had that at the Great Lakes Masjid earlier today um, in, in Brampton. I had a chance to, to go to that service and just to see the love in our community for the Muslim community. They, we have that because of role models. We have that because of the, the work that individuals like you have done 
all right, to let everyone know of the beauty of this land, of the peace of this land, the love of this land, and uh, to be able to say that you're from Brampton is a great source of pride uh, for our city. So on that note, it is my sincere pleasure to officially induct you into the Brampton Arts Walk of Fame, and I am going to present this to you. Real long.